Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us amidst these very heated times. And as I understand, uh, many candidates are running around um, talks around the same time. So luckily, we have this panel recorded for those of you who won't be able to join us this evening. Um, I'd like to welcome our esteemed speakers, Dr. Ghanem al Najjar, Dr. Daniel Tavana, Mr. Mohammed Khalif Al Nayan, and Dr. Courtney Freer, all of whom I'm personally excited and looking forward to their presentations. And of course, I would like to thank Gulf International Forum for hosting this panel under the title, Kuwait Elections, A Chance for Real Change. This question alone is worth analysis and a deep dive to map out what real change means as it pertains to Kuwait politics. This political crisis and political uh, perpetual gridlock is, as Dr. Ghanem Najjar, one, one of our panelists, once wrote, and continues to write for that matter um, and speak about, is actually not new. As Dr. Najjar put it, and I quote, it is that the poor understanding of the political history in Kuwait contributes to an ineffective management, end of quote. Thus, we have a serial crisis and a compulsion to repeat this crisis with the hope of finding something that was lost, a nostalgia echoed in the discourse and rhetoric of candidates, the government, and the public alike. This poor understanding of the political history, as Dr. Najjar put it, and I might add to the political economy, is but one face of our current and past dilemmas. Kuwait is a constitutional monarchy and one that prides itself as a democratic state. But democracy shouldn't be thought of as a shield against you know, despotism or fascism or totalitarianism. It cannot be a scapegoat for our shortcomings and it cannot just be something we conjure up at times of crisis. This panel is going to discuss this chance for real change, perhaps of a new reality in the name of a new era. But adapting to a new reality has been something we've been easily doing, only to repeat and recycle the same events. Because it is the truth that we are so adamant not only to repress, but to disavow. These serial crises that make up Kuwait politics have become enormous in size, but also enormously empty, and that it has resulted in an apathetic but disheartened youth an almost impossible access for women and the marginalized in the public space, a vision for a new Kuwait somewhere in a coma, corruption cases, a deteriorating education system, a housing crisis, an environmental threat, and a dysfunctional labor market, just to name a few. Several months after the uh, recent political crisis in Kuwait, a crisis that saw the formation of four cabinets, a month's suspension of the National Assembly and a caretaker government in just over a year, the Crown Prince, Sheikh Mishal Ahmed al-Sabah, announced an Amiri decree to dissolve the current session of the, of the country's parliament, indicating that it would be resumed after the elections on, in September. Prior to this announcement and following the, the peaceful political protests, otherwise known as the parliamentary sit-ins by 16 members of the National Assembly, the Crown Prince, Sheikh Mishal, delivered a speech on behalf of His Highness the Emir of Kuwait, Sheikh Nawaf Ahmed al-Sabah, a speech that was hailed by the opposition and the public alike. I will quote my dear colleague, Dr. Bedr Saif, who has summarized six major points that were highlighted in the Emir's speech. The first is an adherence to the constitution. The second is no interference in the upcoming elections, including this, that of the Speaker of Parliament. The third it highlighted the important roles of the three branches and direct management is relegated to the executive and legislative branches. The fourth is an open critique of the government. The fifth is that the dis this dissolution of the parliament was made at the people's request. And finally, a veiled reference to forceful measures if there is a return to what we were in. The overarching theme of the June speech, as Dr. Asaf put it, is correcting Kuwait's political path. Using this theme as our trajectory for this evening, we will be looking at the following questions. Who is likely to win Kuwait's upcoming elections? How could the opposition blocs change their agenda and behavior to win more seats? Will factions within Kuwait, such as Islamists, gain or lose seats in the upcoming elections? Will female candidates have a better chance? What changes are likely to occur in the balance of power between the legislative branch and the new prime minister? We will begin this panel with Dr. Ghanem al-Najjar, whom I will quickly introduce before handing over the mic. Dr. Ghanem al-Najjar is a professor of political science at Kuwait University. He is also the director of the Center for Strategic and Future Studies and editor of the Gulf Studies series journal in the UAE. Dr. Najjar has been a visiting scholar at several universities, including Harvard's Human Rights Program, Law School, and the Kennedy School of Government. Previously, Dr. Najjar was a non-resident scholar at the Carnegie Middle East Center. 
He has lectured in for more than 43 universities, academic institutions, and think tanks around the world. Dr. Ghanem, you yourself have written on the June speech, and of course, your weekly column on the political scene. So in your opinion and from your experience, what are the unique factors to this election? Dr. Ghanem, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation. And I uh, guess uh, the question was uh, legitimate. Uh, the answer is that, no, there will be, as we are looking only for election, I don't think there will be a real change. There will be uh, uh, election in itself will not change anything except if we are going to have more uh, uh, reforms. What happened was uh, in, in, uh, in June with the announcement of the Crown Prince, what happened was mainly focused on election and election results. We have, uh, Kuwait is an, is an electoral country. The, the culture of election is, is well versed in everybody's mind. So we don't have a problem with election. And even election in, in the index of the peaceful, uh, uh, of, of running and managing the election in, in general, Kuwait stands high in, in number. So you don't have a problem of violence, and whenever a problem of uh, disagreement or uh, rejection of results, there is a constitutional court that deals with it, and people accept it. So things move uh, fastly. The problem was started when, in 1967, uh, uh, the government, the ruling family, depends on how you look at it, decided to interfere in election. And 1967 was rigged. And that was the last uh, uh, election that was rigged directly. We have indirect interference, and there are many ways to do that. Now we, we are in the 19th elections. Uh, half of them were, were, uh, were cut off. The, the, the parliament didn't complete its, uh, its term. And uh, that's fine. And then there will be, we will go to the, to the uh, terminology. People call this dissolution of parliament. No, it is calling for early election. What happened in most of the elections, it's not a dissolution, rather it is a calling for early election because in the constitution, things are very clear that you have six, uh, uh, 60 days after the, uh, uh, dissolving the parliament, then you have a fresh election, otherwise the dissolved parliament will be reinstated. Uh, so this uh, this part of terminology is, is very important. Uh, the importance here with the electoral reform, we have an announcement by the highest authority, the crown prince uh, here, uh, saying that we all the past was the government was interfering in elections. Why he said that? We have to analyze the person and the politician in his uh, in his uh, place. He is a person that was out of politics for a very long time. Uh, so he want to say specifically that I have nothing to do with the past. So we want to do something new, fresh election, and also we want to say something that is also important, that we are not going to interfere in the election of the Speaker of, of the House and parliamentary committees. These are very co uh, contentious issues. Uh, the, the, uh, the Speaker of the House election is major issue during the campaign. Now, we don't have it. We don't have it as such. And also, the government initiative, this is the first time that we have an election where the government is making the initiative and uh, 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 making mostly the political landscape much weaker in terms of issues. We have issues that are not there, uh, compounded by the individual nature of the Kuwaiti uh, politics. Here we don't have political, we have political parties. I, here we, we don't have legalized political parties as entities. So most of the 
most of the candidates, regardless of how popular uh, are they, they are individuals. And that weakens even the possibility of going, uh, going forward. When uh, the, 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 uh, the uh, uh, issue of change takes place, uh, it's when we have an agreement and concession. What happened now with the, uh, with the speech of the uh, Crown Prince, it, there were some concessions because constitutionally, the government has the right to vote to the, uh, to the speaker and have the right to vote to parliamentary committees. Yet they said that we are not going. That, the other one, the political side of not interfering in election, I still don't know how it will not interfere in election because this has been going on as, as a culture for, for a long time. Uh, the first time in 1967 was direct, but in, in, in most of the time, it was indirect. The government went even further in 1960, 1976, 1986. And the, then that was a dissolution of parliament because it passed, uh, it, it surpassed the 60 days uh, limit uh, for the uh, uh, having, uh, reinstating the parliament or having fresh, uh, fresh, uh, fresh election. Other than that, from from 99 onwards, uh, all, all uh, elections were, uh, were within the constitutional framework. Then you have a, a dissolution, aside from the constitutional uh, court that also dissolved a uh, couple of, uh, of, of parliaments uh, in, in 2012, yet they were, they were back uh, in a new fresh election as uh, uh, as such, why this is not going not going to go forward? Here we have a problem that has which is the bigger picture: the balance of power. The balance of power is within the ruling family, the government uh, hand. And 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 no matter what you do, at the end of the day, a decision will be made from the top to stop the uh, the, the experiment. Okay. Whether whether we uh, see uh, the uh, the uh, commitment to constitution, this is not not new. All government and uh, ruling family uh, committed themselves to the constitution every time. They say the same thing. This is so. This is not an issue in terms of of rhetorics, but the issue of how are we going to function after the election? Is it going to be uh, uh, real cooperation? There are issues on the table. There are issues. Things are going backward, not going forward. And uh, major issues. Now we have uh, a new prime minister who's trying to change. I guess if, if the, the government as a big elephant is not trimmed down, there will be no change. This is a major issue, the bureaucracy. Bureaucracy is a force by itself. It, it goes by itself to achieve its ends. And, and it's so big and so powerful that very difficult to change it. And if this is not being looked at seriously, and if we don't have uh, that kind of cooperation between the government. The government now is is uh, is, is scoring point. They scored major points. The ruling family, they, uh, because they went really further, and they said, "Okay, we are going to uh, to do things that were never thought of." The the voting by the civil civil ID. And also from the beginning, uh, trying to stop the uh, uh, primary elections, tribal primary elections. Now there is a big issue of one candidate who is supposed to be a, a government uh, person who is being uh, yani, uh, followed. And maybe I'm, I'm not in Kuwait at the moment, but... I was told that he is in prison. He's being questioned. He busy, 
whatever. These are new things. These are new things. How they will affect the, the, the election, they, they, it will affect the election in, in, in many ways. And, and we have to understand that all elections in Kuwait, mostly, I would say, uh, the strangest one was 1981. It was, this is the odd election because the, the, the idea was behind it to, uh, to amend the constitution. So the number of candidates reached uh, the highest number. Other than that, still we are in the average. We are not really higher than, than the usual. Uh, uh, but then you have the uh, uh, 25%, 30%, 27%. That's the change. This is normal. I don't think that we will see. I, uh, from my observation, I guess at least I have checked about 22 to 23 candidates they will win. From abroad, I could, I could say that. Uh, there are others who will, who will fight on from 6 to, to 10. And the possibility of uh, making a comeback for, uh, for women candidates, I could see that about three, maybe three uh, women candidates might compete, might make a real comp competition. I'm not sure whether they will win or not, but they will be close to the uh, uh, in, 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 in the election. But how much this will change the uh, the process? This is I, I don't think this will change it unless we are going to see real intentions and work legal legal the, the parliament is 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 legal institution uh, and needs to work on legal issues and i have a term which i i described what's happening the legal uh, issue uh, called it the the uh, the legal corruption they do produce legal bills but the legal bills are, are incompatible with reality and they keep changing them finally which i want to stop here because of the interest of time uh, we don't do much study of the uh, 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 judicial uh, institution the judicial institution plays a major role in kuwait elections at the moment, we have an issue. At the moment, now we have an issue because some, uh, because of the uh, uh, bill that was passed about uh, uh, certain violations, a uh, number of candidates were removed from the list, and now they are fighting this in, in court, and and court goes step forward and step backward. Uh, uh, and it's it's going to the constitutional court. And I have I now I'm working on a study about uh, Kuwaiti judiciary, a political study. It's never been studied. They just say nice things about the judiciary when it it uh, uh, makes a good uh, ruling, and they say it's a bad uh, court uh, if it's not. So this is just the general picture i hope that i uh, was able to give it some points here and there and uh, we'll wait for any questions or uh, follow up thank you thank you so much uh, dr ghanem that was uh, most illuminating and a very realist uh, introduction into this this talk um our next speaker is my dear friend dr daniel tivana uh, Dr. Devana's research interests include a focus on elections, identity, and comparative polit political behavior, as well as the dynamics of uh, political opposition in authoritarian regimes. He studies, uh, he studies these issues in the Middle East and North Africa, where he uses a variety of methods and sources of data to study electoral politics. His research is motivated by a broader interest in understanding the origins of contemporary patterns of mass politics across the region. He received his PhD from the Department of Politics at Princeton University in September 2021. 
uh, Dr. Daniel, in your PhD, I remember a presentation that you once gave um, of the findings with respect to the electoral process, and you did an excellent mapping of the different facets of the tribal families as well. So from your theoretical work and examination um, of the current scene, what are the recent changes in the electoral process in Kuwait? It's, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you uh, so much to Gulf International Forum for the invitation, and, and thanks to everyone for coming. Um, the, the bad news is that it's very difficult to follow uh, Dr. Bonham, uh, and it's hard to kind of match the incredible amount of information and, and wisdom that he shared. The good news about going after Dr. Bonham is that he can't tell you you're wrong until much later in the event. So I'm very happy about that. Um, I want to say just a couple things in my short comments to start. Um, I want to make well, let me say first to build on, on some of what's been said already in the introduction. Generally speaking, early elections to me are an institutional failure, um, you know, as a baseline. And second, uh, changes take time to understand and see. So while things are changing in the electoral system and the electoral process, it will be some time before we can really kind of assess what their effects will be. Um, and this has happened really at every stage in, in Kuwait's history, whenever there has been a change in the electoral law or the electoral process writ large. So 1981 was a very different election from the subsequent elections that came after it in 85, even 92, 96, 99. Similarly, 2008 was a very different election from the ones that came before it. Um, in 2013, with the rise of the one vote system, was also a very different type of election. And so it always takes time when there are changes to be able to assess what's going on and, and what will last and, and what won't. I wanna highlight two kind of broad categories of changes and then come back to these at the end uh, to examine to what extent the government is or, or isn't serious about, about change or, or reform or at least the way it manages or, or supervises the elections. Um, the first category of changes are by and large legal changes or changes to the way the government has implemented or observed the law in the conduct of elections. And the first big one I think is that the body of registered voters has changed up until this year in order to register to vote, you had to actually show up and register your name physically to be entered into the voter the voter rolls. And so just a short time before the election this year, the government decided to change this system and automatically register every eligible citizen. And this is not unheard of. Many countries have uh, active versus passive registration systems. But what it's done effectively is increase the number of registered voters who are eligible to vote by about 25%. And this 25% is not felt evenly in each district. It's a little over 10% in the first district, 33% in the second, 25% in the third, 30% in the fourth, and 40% in the fifth. The injection of these new voters previously unregistered voters into each of these districts makes things in general a lot more uncertain, right? So first and foremost, it's going to raise the amount of votes each candidate is uh, needs in order to win, right? And we don't really know a lot about the, the, the behavior of these voters. We don't really know if they're even going to vote because they haven't previously been registered. What this new system also did is take, reg is take voters who are registered outside of their district. According to some estimates, this is 10 and maybe as many as 15% of all registered voters under the previous system and put them back into the places, the districts where they actually live. This too is going to affect how many votes candidates are able to get and the distribution of votes across more experienced candidates versus less experienced candidates. So all in all, these changes are uncertain. They're going to raise the threshold, make it harder for each individual candidate to win, right? 
I mean, there's just a lot we don't know about how these new voters are going to vote if they even are going to vote, right? And so this is the big one. Um, the second change, uh, the second sort of category of changes is um, a change, I think, on the margins in who's actually running. So Dr. Rana mentioned earlier that there's a 10% increase in the number of candidates. This is the most, I believe, that have ever run in an election. And it's a 10% increase from 2020, which was itself a 10% increase from 2016. And again, this increase in candidates is going to have countervailing effects on how individual people in districts campaign and, and vote. There are also a lot of, uh, in this pool of, of increased candidates, there are a lot of people running who both haven't run before, but also used to run a very long time ago and haven't in recent years. And this is true across all districts and across all groups. For example, in the first district, former MPs, Mukhlid al-Azmi, Wasmi al-Wasmi are running. In the third district, famously, the former speaker of the assembly, Ahmed Saadun is running. Mohammed Juwehil is running, who has been disqualified. And in the fourth district and the fifth district, there are a number, uh, Daifallah Buramia, Obeid al-Wasmi, who ran in a runoff election, Khalid Shukher and others. These new candidates, uh, former MPs, haven't run in about 10 years. And we don't really know how well they're going to be able to command the support of voters in the district. A lot of people think that, you know, these people are running sort of symbolically, right? Others think that they might be able to pull votes away from established candidates um, in their districts. And I think uh, something else that's happening that's new in this election, but not unprecedented, is the endorsement of different candidates by political elites who are former MPs or different political movements. And so I know this statement of values, which, which uh, Courtney will speak about in a, bit, in, in a bit, is one kind of example of this, but also individuals are endorsing candidates in different places in a way that kind of mirrors the old block system. And we don't know what effect this will have on the results or what happens when individuals get into parliament, um, but it's something that could potentially have an effect on who wins or who loses in the election. And again, this isn't without precedent, but um, it's something to, something to think about. I think taking these uh, changes, uh, some of which are a product of government policy or changes to it, others which are kind of responses, right, by individuals, um, is, is can we say that the government is, is serious about changing the electoral process? And I think there are some signs that the government is serious and there are some signs that the government is still not really entirely interested. Um, and so, you know, there are signs that the government is cracking down on vote buying. The oldest member of the National Assembly, the member who has run the largest number of times, had recently had his home raided. Um, this is new. Uh, this particular MP is considered very pro-government, right? And I think it's a sign to many that something is, is, is different and going on. Cracking down on the primaries. As Dr. Ranam said, the refusal to interfere in the electoral process, the enforcement of, of media regulations, which have been on the books, but are really not enforced. These are all things that, at least in, in the recent decade, are, are pretty new. But then there are other things that indicate that the government is not entirely serious. Uh, for example, this decision to change the voter registration system, even though it was welcomed by most political actors and, and seen as generally being more fair and equitable, the decision was made unilaterally, kind of ad hoc, without a whole lot of deliberation, even though it was something that people have been advocating for some time. No change in the districts, no change in the one vote system. These are also things that are constraining. The banning of candidates, uh, this is also the extent of it seems um, pretty, pretty, pretty new, but we'll see how those court cases go. So these are signs that, you know, some of the changes may be cosmetic, right? And, and even if the changes are, are themselves serious and, and taken to their kind of logical end, we don't really know 
what effect that's going to have on how the government manages its own relations with the elected parliament once it's in office. And I, I think this is the big question. Um, I'll stop there. There, there's a lot to talk about. There's a lot of um, a, a lot of changes or, or a lot of things that are still the same that haven't changed. But happy to answer uh, some of those in, in Q and A, and I welcome others' comments as well. Thank you so much, Daniel. This was uh, it's it like you're opening up what uh, Dr. Radom began with, and there's so much to think about and discuss. Uh, we'll get to that. Um, in the discussion. Um, our third speaker for this evening um, is uh, Mr. Mohamed Khalif Lithnayan. Um, Mr. Mohamed Khalif Lithnayan is a, is a founder and president of Kuwait-based Taurus Center for Middle East Studies. He is a researcher of the Middle East region with a focus on public opinion and election affairs. He holds a master's degree from Durham University with a concentration on Middle Eastern studies. Mr. Mohammed, uh, what are the differences, in your opinion, based on what you heard from the, you know, the two, the uh, previous panelists, um, the differences between the candidates in the upcoming uh, and previous elections, and how have candidates' profiles, programs, and backgrounds per district changed in the current elections? What does it mean for the relationship between the government and the parliament, and how would that affect the parliamentarians' work? Mr. Mohammed, the floor is yours. Good evening, everyone, and everywhere. Uh, I am talking with you today. I am across the election seminars in the campaign, across to me. Uh, I am really happy today to talk with you about the Kuwait elections, a chance uh, for real change. Uh, and uh, thank you for inviting me in this uh, uh, discussing. Uh, this election, I think this election in Kuwait uh, 2022 will be the difficult election in Kuwait, in Kuwait history. To be honest, I think talking about this topic really complicated because we have semi-democratic system and we live in, in a democratic region. And, but I am thinking nowadays, everything in Kuwait is changing. In our think tank, we focus on, on who will win and who will lose using surveys and analysis in Kuwait. I think the main point, the main topic is reform and fighting corruption in this election that will lead to a political stability. But I have some points to discuss about Kuwait's upcoming parliamentary elections. A few MPs announced they will not be seeking re-election, signaling a change and shift in popular mood. The popular mood in Kuwait is the main influencer in people's chooses. Public speeches of some strong figures can impact the popular mood in Kuwait. Moreover, we cannot find a solution for every problems in Kuwait if we don't understand the Kuwait's popular mood. We, in these elections, we see, I think, the president, changing the president, uh, maybe around 68% we will change in the, uh, this election. A noticeable thing in the election is the lack of dominating theme. In the last election, the themes was burdening former opposition figures who were in exile, such as Salam al-Barraq, Faisal al-Muslim, Jam'an al-Harbish, so on who were live in Turkey. 
he was live, where live in Turkey and opposing Marzouk al Ghanim, the previous speaker of parliament, who was widely seen as an obstacle to their return to Kuwait. The next parliament will likely be more diverse as various women and minority figures are competing for membership. I am thinking this election will be in this parliament, I think two women will be win in this election. Such as Jinan Bushehri and Ali Khalid. They will be they will they will be in, in this election. Different last election. That's different in the last election. The government moved softly against voter fraud and vote buying. A former MP is currently in a prison. The, the relationship between parliament and the government is likely to be a claimer than in the previous years. As the government have stepped in the direction of reform and anti-corruption. My last point in this, the next parliament will have to tackle major issues such as corruption, political reform, and electoral reform. Uh, that's uh, my boy today. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you so much, Mr. Mohammed, uh, for this, and good luck to whoever you're with now at the seminar. Um, our final speaker for this evening is Dr. Courtney Freer. Previously, Dr. Freer was Assistant Professional Research Fellow at the LSE Middle East Center from 2015 to 2020. Uh, Dr. Freer was a research officer for the Kuwait program at the LSE Middle East Center. Her work focuses on the domestic politics of the Gulf states, particularly the roles played by Islamism and tribalism. Her book, Rentier Islamism, the Influence of the Muslim Brotherhood in Gulf Monarchies, is ba based on her PhD thesis at the University of Oxford and published by Oxford University Press in 2018, examines the social uh, sociopolitical role played by the Muslim Brotherhood groups in Kuwait, Qatar, and the United Arab Emirates. She, had, she previously worked at the Brookings Doha Center and the U.S. Saudi Arabian Business Council. Dr. Courtney holds a B.A. from Princeton University in Near Eastern Studies and an M.A. in Middle Eastern Studies from, the, from George Washington University. Um, Dr. Fear also just recently co-authored an excellent book with Dr. Anu Desharaf entitled uh, Tribalism and Political Power in the Gulf, State Building and National Identity in Kuwait, Qatar and the UAE. And so Dr. Fear, from this research uh, for the book and your previous research and experience, how do you think the um, Islamists and women will perform in the upcoming elections? What elements usually um, affect women candidates' chance to win parliamentary seats? And do you echo as our speakers that there might be a chance for women to win in this election? Dr. Fear, the, the floor is yours. Great, thank you so much for having me and uh, thanks so much to GIF for arranging this event. It's been fantastic fantastic listening to all of you all um, and helping me kind of make sense of, of these elections as they come on onto the scene. So I was asked to talk specifically about Islamists and female candidates and I'll start by talking about Islamists. I guess the biggest story that has come out of Kuwait so far with the election is the signing of this so-called values document. So on September the 12th, this document was put forward, which called for the implementation of a variety of social policy changes, among them the implementation of gender segregation in education, as well as the prohibition of gender mix mixing in a variety of spaces, um, festivals, as well as swimming pools and clubs and hotels and other entertainment centers. It also calls for things like the activation of a more modest dress code in educational institutions, amending the law against imitating the opposite sex, 
criminalizing tattooing on the body, criminalizing uh, insulting the companions of the Prophet Muhammad, in addition to uh, it's already criminalized to insult uh, the Prophet Muhammad himself. So a lot of changes basically gesturing their uh, they're basically their commitment to Islamist social policy issues. And thus far, about 47 people, I, last I checked, there were 47 people who had signed onto this document. Um, the document itself had been has been largely backed by uh, Islamist uh, preacher Othman al-Khamis, who is associated with Salafism. And he announced his support for the document, stating that it's not a political project, but rather a moral religious tutelage over society. And indeed, I think that that this document, it, it, I'm hesitant to make too much of this document, given that it's very unclear whether these types of law legislation, well, A, whether the people who have signed on to this document will get into parliament, and B, whether if they did, th this legislation would ever come to a vote in the first place. Um, and indeed, so, so far, the uh, document has been adopted by most people, most of the signatories have been from the fourth and fifth constituencies. And these are the, the outlying constituencies, the areas in which also we see more numbers of voters having been added due to the change in voter registration. Um, and there is this ongoing split, I think we're seeing an ongoing polarization on the, on the one side between kind of more secular urban people in Kuwait and more kind of people in, in outlying areas who back Islamist candidates or who, if for some other reason, want to go back to what are seen as kind of traditional uh, Kuwaiti values and practices. And so it's it's not super surprising that we would see more support in these outlying districts. Um, one thing that I've seen as like a takeaway in some of the Western press coverage of this is suggesting that there's Islamist unity behind this document. And certainly I think it is helpful for some Islamists to sign on to this document because they're, they're probably not losing voters they would have captured anyway by doing so. But I don't think it, it's fair to see it as, as a harboring Islamist unity or, or announcing Islamist unity. Indeed, uh, Shia Islamists did not sign on to the document. Uh, Hadas, the Muslim Brotherhood uh, political branch, has not endorsed it either. And indeed, this is, as I mentioned before, mostly vague statements, whereas what tends to attract voters are more programmatic, um, more programmatic pro promises, things that uh, address actual issues in the country that people are, or more kind of urgent political issues in the country. So things like fighting corruption, uh, ed reforming education system, addressing the housing issue, um, addressing the Bedoun issue as well. And so I think a lot for a lot of people, that is what will, will guide their vote, the candidates' positions on these issues, rather than whether they've signed on to this document. Um, and, and indeed, the, the signing of this document led to a firestorm over on, on Twitter, which I'm sure a lot of you have seen. Um, and, and some people have called for people to boycott voting for the candidates who had signed on to the document. And indeed, I mean, there's a number of reasons that there is opposition to this type of document. One is that people believe that it is, as I mentioned before, distracting from other issues which are seen as more politically urgent or economically urgent. Another issue is that people believe that it will restrict individual uh, individual freedoms, individual liberties. Um, and and another is that it's it's um, yeah that it's it's really not necessarily easy to put in place in a place like Kuwait. And one thing that we've seen in terms of institutional backlash is that the Association of Faculty Members at Kuwait University has already rejected the document, uh, stating that engaging in that, that engaging in that document, uh, in particular, the demand to have uh, female and male students in separate educational facilities is violating um, previous rulings by the constitutional court. So we've already seen moves against that document at an institutional level. In addition, Kuwait's uh, Women's Cultural and Social Society released a statement rejecting the values document, emphasizing that Kuwait is a civil and constitutional state in which uh, personal rights and freedoms are protected by the constitution. And so I think this document does, I mean, the fact that it was signed does highlight the, the extent to which social policy still matters for Islamists. And it shows that there is, there is some polarization in Kuwait. And we've seen this, this is not the first instance this year when we've seen social policy issues come to the fore and and demonstrate that there are very large fissures in terms of social practice. Um, we saw this with calls to ban Netflix. We thought, call, saw this with um, the cancellation of a yoga retreat earlier in the year. So social policy issues still do matter. It's just uncertain the extent to which they mobilize voters, especially given the changes to the system this year. And just to, to take a moment also to talk about female voters. 
So the last I checked, I believe there are 27 women running. I think there were 28 in the last election. I'm, I'm not sure if these, these numbers have changed in recent days. I, I mean, I am glad to hear that, that people are are optimistic about women getting voted into. Uh, we've seen we see we've seen for a long time strong female candidates. We've also seen the creation of, of infrastructure to assist female candidates. We see things like Madawi's list coming online to help support females running for parliament. I think candidates like Ali Khalid, Janan, and Janan Bosheri are have a quite a good chance of of getting into parliament. That said, it's it's very difficult to predict, so I'm hesitant to do so. And I think there are still difficulties that that women face in the Kuwaiti system. One is the one vote um, system makes it more difficult for women to capture that one vote. Um, and so that is is one issue that I think will keep being faced. Another is, as Dan mentioned, we have more voters. We also have more candidates than in last in the last elections. And so when you have more candidates, most of whom are men. It, it numerically doesn't help uh, female candidates as well. Um, so that said, I, I mean, one thing that I've seen this year that I, I haven't really seen to such an extent in past elections is, is very clear messaging from Islamist candidates reaching out to female voters and stating that women, female candidates do need to get into parliament. And so I think we are seeing hopefully some kind of cultural sea change where it, com in, where it comes to the acceptance of female candidates. And so I think that is something um, that's encouraging. And, and as I said, we do have you know, programs like Madawi's List, which are helping female candidates gain visibility because they do still face another disadvantage through not being able to have access to a lot of kind of tribal diwaniyat um, through which uh, candidates often gain support. Um, so I'll go ahead and, and stop there and we can keep talking in the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Fear. Um, thank you for bringing up the values document, which I think most of us resented, openly resented this document. Um, I have a few questions from the forum. So what I'm going to do is read out the question, and then maybe we can go around like two minutes each. Uh, you can respond to this question. So the first question I have from the forum is, um, how could the upcoming elections impact the remaining um, of the GCC states, considering that Kuwait has the most democratic process in the Gulf, and to some extent, the Arab world. So will our elections have some sort of impact on the GCC, or is the GCC kind of like working with their own plans right now, and they don't pretty much like look at Kuwaiti politics? So I'll start with you, Dr. Ghanem. You're muted, Dr. Ghanem. You're muted. Yeah. Okay. Yes. All right. Okay. Uh, this is an old story about uh, Kuwaiti politics and openness and uh, and the GCC. Well, I always look at the GCC as each country on its own. Always, the local dynamics of each country really impact what happens in, in local politics. Yes, Kuwait was uh, was. Uh, making uh, some kind of uh, uh, impact. Uh, but at least now we are seeing some openness in certain sectors, not the political side, like, you know, what's happening in Saudi, for instance, that's not un unimaginable before. Uh, so there are things that are moving in the Gulf. I'm sure that Kuwait has something to do with it in the background, not necessarily in the forefront. People will not... Now, every, almost all uh, GCC countries, they have some sort of election, some sort of election. And, and that, they always measure it with Kuwaiti uh, model, that we don't want to do something that goes far enough to, uh, to, to replicate what's happening in Kuwait. And it will never happen, because it's, in Kuwait, it has a lot of uh, other factors affecting uh, uh, the, the dynamics, the the perception will remain on top. You know everything, even for election. We have over the years, and I say I have a theory of waves. I say that Kuwait started in 1961, 62 until the first election, and then it took back back seat. The government, the ruling family, decided to jump into the uh, 
the the uh, the uh, experiment and make it different, make it more authoritarian, but to keep the constitution. And that that went until the twenty uh, second of June of the uh, uh, speech by the crown prince. This is a hope that things will will come back again to see things as in the uh, as in the past. For the Gulf, I think the Gulf, all the Gulf, they are watching Kuwait because it is the only experiment that might do something about about political participation and 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 some some for for an, or another. So I would I would uh, I I can understand your hesitation, uh, Courtney, about the uh, uh, women, but I can feel this is this is a feeling. It is not substantiated by uh, uh, by pulling or anything like that. Uh, uh, I have a panel, by the way, on the twenty seventh with Princeton, the Arab barometer that we participated in the Kuwait survey, but that's another another issue. But you can feel it in in uh, back when uh, when the four uh, uh, MPs uh, women uh, got elected, I was probably I don't know about if there are other people. I was on uh, television and I said that four women will will win, and nobody even accepted my my statement. They said you are any. You are pro woman rights and this and this is you are uh, being optimistic, huh? But exactly the th- the four that I predicted they will win, they won. Maybe yani, this is nice, but I can feel that there is a competition. There is some kind of competition, and there is also a perception. The perception when we were really down, that there is no hope just to the opposite. Now there is a perception when we talk about the election, change in election. I think it's all about perception. How much the government serious of, you know, employing these changes in the real politics, not in terms of election. Election itself, you can really do a lot of things in it and you can make it look better. It is better now. There are some you know, problems with it, but still, it's much better than the election in the past. So how much this will be reflected in after election? First, there will be no vote. The government will not vote for the speaker. They will not vote for the uh, uh, for the parliamentary uh, committees. Would that be good or bad? I don't know. It all depends on who will come in 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 in, uh, in in parliament again the issue of the weakness of the parliamentarians is that they are individuals they cannot really uh, implement what they want and that will continue unfortunately it will continue the government will not like to have really organized groups in in, in parliament although if we have organized groups things will be better even for the government i think i'll stop Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ghanem. And that kind of adds a, a, like a sub comment that we can return to after um, we just go around. Um, Dr. Daniel, what about you? Do you see an impact of the Kuwaiti elections on the GCC? I, uh, my, my feeling is that most uh, other countries in the GCC or, or the wider region um, don't have much interest in parliamentary politics in Kuwait, uh, g- generally speaking. Um, I think they see it as as a, sh- as a, as a sideshow and maybe in different ways, an indicator of where public opinion is, where people kind of, uh, where their feelings are at vis-a-vis uh, political Islam or something else. But I don't think that they, uh, the outcome um, very much shapes either how they see Kuwait generally or um, how they structure their relationship with the government. I do think though that um, the region today is in a very different place than it was, certainly in the 2020 election um, and even the 2016 election. The 2016 election was three weeks after the election of, of Donald Trump in the US. The 2020 election of course was during COVID 
things, even if they haven't improved in the region, they're just different. Um, things are largely stable in Saudi Arabia. Relations between Iran and the Gulf are starting to very slowly improve. And there's a possibility that there might be an agreement between Iran and the U.S. in the coming um, weeks, months, years, whatever. Um, and so I think the region is just in a different place. Things are a little more um, stable, um, you know, with all the uh, challenges that come with that word. And so I think that that kind of matters. I think that 2016 and especially 2020, um, I think many in Kuwait were kind of worried about some of these um, dynamics. And I, and I don't really think that that's, you know, it's still an issue. It's still something that I think Kuwaitis think a lot about and talk a lot about, but, but I do think it's very different from the past two elections. Um, and, and perhaps, you know, that, that matters. Of course, different regional actors have their favorites in parliament. This is not new. This is as old, uh, you know, this has been a trend since the sixties in Kuwait. Um, but I don't really think that by and large, um, it makes a, a whole lot of difference. Thank you so much. Um, I think we lost our third speaker. Um, so I'm going to go to Dr. Courtney. Um, given that you map most of your books actually look at more than one country. So in your opinion, do you see an impact of the Kuwaiti elections on the, you know, the other, the rest of the GCC? And if you would like to also respond to what Dr. Ghanem said, uh, please feel free. Well, I, I hope Dr. Ghanem is, is right in terms of female candidates getting into parliament. Um, I would love to hear how many he thinks and who exactly this this election, um, because it would be interesting to know. But I, I hope that there is a change. Um, it's I feel like it's it's diff I'm hesitant to predict because I'm not I'm never been that good at it. And um, also given the, the changes in in terms of registered voters. Um, but in general, and as for the question about the impact on the Gulf in general, I, I agree with a lot of what what Dana said really uh, in terms of these countries not really looking to Kuwait in terms of like a model. I do think that one way in which they do look at Kuwait is to see, as he mentioned, which trends are popular. And Kuwait is a is a really great place to see that because you have political candidates from, from around the spectrum. You have Salafis, Shia, um, tribe members, Muslim Brotherhood, women, you know, secular liberals, like all kinds of different candidates. And so seeing who wins can be a good, give a good sense of where popular opinion is in, in Kuwait and then potentially um, beyond Kuwait. I think, I mean, I think in general, you know, when, when there have been many elections in close succession in Kuwait, a lot of people in the Gulf take this to, to demonstrate that parliamentary life is actually dangerous and can, can harbor instability. Um, so I think if, if also this parliament ends up lasting its entire tenure, that could also potentially have some kind of impact. I do think another story that comes out of a lot of, I mean, we saw this with the Shura Council election in Qatar last year, we saw this with the Kuwait election in 2020, is, you know, women's access to institutionalized political, um, you know, part of political life, basically, in, in the Gulf. And in Qatar, no women were elected in, uh, and same as Kuwait, no women were elected in in 2020. And so this led to, to, I think, healthy conversation about how to facilitate female participation in in political institutions in the Gulf. And so I do think that that, that those con those conversations may continue to be had um, e either way. I mean, if women are are elected into the parliament, as I hope they are, or or if they're not. Um, and I think it's it's healthy to think about the ways in which um you know, women are, are disadvantaged in systems and, and ways in which they can be assisted to, to gain more access since they are, um, you know, about half of the electorate. So, um, yeah, that's that's how I, I guess I would say there is some impact of Kuwaiti politics, but um, but not not to a huge extent. Thank you so much. We actually have a question from the audience, uh, Faraj Saidi. Um, his question is, uh, do you think that the new collaboration is developing by the new government and the so-called opposition leaders and the MPs, such as the, or the former MPs, such as um, Sadun, and how do you read his participation in this election? Dr. Ghanem? Okay, well, uh... 
it is expected and not expected. And I guess that uh, the uh, Ahmed Saadoun as an experienced uh, speaker, uh, he felt that he was mistreated for, for a long time. You know? And uh, because of that, there was no room within the political structure for him to come back until what happened now. So that's why I see that things are moving in a different direction. My take is that uh, he will be more cooperative. He will be able, and I think I, when we talk about cooperation, is not being loyal to the government. Cooperation means putting things together to produce legal uh, bills that serve the people and try to make life better for everybody. And that's, that's I don't think that I see that from the, the steps taken by, by the government, especially that we are talking about anti-corruption, uh, before this parliament, before this issue, that the anti-corruption started, at least from the top uh, level, from uh, Sheikh Nasser Sabah Lahmed. He, he made it uh, an issue from the top. Uh, and then it continued. Now we have several people from the top are either in prison or are being in, 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 uh, in, a, in a bad situation. So these are the things that will create a good perception. And it make perception is more important than reality in politics. Much more important than reality. So if, if I perceive you that you are conspiring against me, you are corrupt, no matter what you do, I will not accept. But if you do certain things, and these are the points that the government and the crown prince was able to, to pinpoint and put it in his speech, yes, things are moving as perception. And perception in Kuwait changed dramatically, changed dramatically about what's happening. Uh, from the lower point of no hope, to the midway point of hope. I wouldn't say that. And I, I still, my belief that there will be no change unless there is a serious work on major issue, uh, housing, bedoun, uh, human rights, uh, uh, economic diversification, and others. There are so many issues that are there, well known, but nobody is serious about them. Yani the issue of the bedoun, nobody is serious in, on top management they are not serious about that they don't want to solve it so it, it, it it's the housing housing is there and it's it's possible to solve but and and the government yet it's number one issue in the whole uh, uh, surveys number one issue is housing it is completely neglected and they they go after uh, uh, now when we talked about the issue of this uh, uh, the the document of uh, uh, values document it came because there is a vacuum there is a serious vacuum i looked at it it is a hasty document it didn't even say things about even the 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 uh, uh, the, the islamic point of view it was it was scattered was uh, 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 linguistically it was weak and issues were just muddled up uh, yeah, I don't know if I can describe it. It was just like the 13 uh, conditions that when when uh, the the uh, foreign minister of uh, of the United States asked the uh, the government of the Gulf to say something about why they are boycotting Qatar, they put just 13 uh, conditions which were not applicable. They, it was hasty. And because of that, now they are back. So this is a document that has no basis. And no one, even if he signs it, there is no legal commitment. Even if they sign it, just forget about it. And, and that's it. They, they want to have an influence. They want, and, and I was surprised also when we go again to the, the, to the general, uh, larger picture, that you don't see candidates getting together and making a real statement. 
candidates, even good ones, even good candidates, they could get together and make a statement. They didn't even do that, which is which which tells about how sporadic and how chaotic the situation is. Uh, I, 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 you know, I had some conversation with some of the candidates and their their people. They are confused. I know personally people, at least about 15 people who were registered, but they are not in the country because they never registered. They are not in the country. So these are examples I know personally. So they are confused with the number of voters and who are they and where they will vote. This is a, these are candidates who are almost sure of winning. And they are confused. That's their opinion. They say, well, we don't know. We are afraid that something will happen that will, will completely change. Change in the Kuwaiti electoral politics is constant, always, always. In each election, we have change. And, and the change has uh, 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 two factors. One, uh, current, current MPs lose or current MPs don't run for election. But normally change is happening only for the election itself. Uh, this is something that uh, we never had before. We never had a government acceptable by the general public made a, a, an initiative. So it took step forward. How much this will continue? I have no idea. And and crises are coming. I'm I'm. I'm specialist in crisis, crisis studies. So I did politics of crisis. I'm looking at the crisis. Why we have this crisis? It's it's major. You know, you just put it in the balance of power. You have a rentier state. You have these are things that cause crisis when the powerful element in the country, which is ruling family and and, and government, is not interested in getting things done. So they are not interested. And then you have this large elephant called the bureaucracy that impedes any kind of movement forward. Well, you are bound to have a crisis and, other, and, and more crisis. And, and that possible to solve. Kuwait is easy, manageable, small country, has good resources and good manpower. Good manpower. They're investing in a lot of people who are good to, to manage the country. Yet it is not happening. That's what makes people more frustrated. Thank you so much. I feel like we can go on and talk about this like for hours because there's just so much we can open up. Um, we do have 10 minutes. So um, Daniel, I'm going to let you respond to this, but I'm going to add another question. Uh, so the, 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 just as a refresh, the question was about uh, MP Sadun. Um, and do you see any kind of collaboration? But there's also this other question from the forum, uh, you know, in respect to what was said in the, the, the speech about the government not interfering in the Speaker of Parliament. Do you think that this election, because there's going to be a new speaker, will remain a, will it remain a contentious issue, mainly because um, Azubul Ghanem is not running for re-election? Or do you see it kind of changing because Merzoub is not going to be on this? Uh, so there's this part about Sadun running, and then there's this other side that's you know, will, will it change because we don't have Mirzakul Ghanem? And I think I, I think one of the things that that um, I don't know motivated this values document, and also I think was a, a, the candidate Shaib Moizri was talking about kids being segregated in kindergartens because they ha they have nothing else to show because they their their target is kind of not running. So um, so how do you see that? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the question. I'll, I'll try and answer both the question about um, uh, Ahmed Sadun and and uh, Marzouk uh, together. Um, my my impression is that Sadun running um, is very much connected to uh, Marzouk Al Ghanem's decision not to run. And I think I don't think that one caused the other, but I think that they're related. I think generally speaking, many people who observe and analyze Kuwaiti politics, um, underestimate the power and influence of the Speaker of the National Assembly and how that per how important that person is to 
the conduct of parliament and, and government relations and the implementation of, of policy. Um, and I think by and large, the, the gridlock that has defined the recent period is very much a consequence of Marzouk al Ghanim's inability to make deals. Um, I think Marzouk al Ghanim has been, was, was speaker for almost 10 years. And I think in that time, the parliament itself has become increasingly authoritarian um, in, in increasingly exclusive. Uh, certain people are allowed to participate and, and speak and make deals and pass bills and ask questions and have their comments televised. Certain people are not. And I think that's created an atmosphere of just constant tension. Um, and so I think that has been a, a, a problem um, that the government has sort of realized that while, yes, the government is not actually taking many steps to fix some of these problems, a lot of that gridlock is in, is in and of itself a consequence of Marzouk al Ghanim's inability to lead the parliament. And I think that stands in sharp contrast with somebody like Ahmed Sa'dun, who, although he was very much a thorn in the government's side at times, um, was able to make deals, was able to work with different factions in the parliament. You know, again, he, he wasn't perfect and hit him, he himself was involved in a lot of controversies, controversies over his very long tenure as speaker. But at the end of the day, you need a speaker who can make deals. The speaker has to be somebody with political acumen, somebody who knows the institution, somebody who knows the different constituencies, somebody knows what different types of MPs want. And it's a very small number of people, I think, that can do that job and do it well. And it, it, it may or may not be Sa'dun, um, I don't know. But I think Sa'dun's running in the election in and of itself signals that that type of leadership is, is something that's needed. Um, and I think that's something that the government itself may decide works better for it overall. We'll see. Um, so I do think that these two things are, are, are somewhat related and they do, I think, shed light on the importance of the speaker um, just as a person who manages an institution that is responsible for setting government policy. And so I'm eager to see how the election for the speaker kind of turns out um, and whether or not the government will hold true to its commitment to, to not get involved. Um, so, so a lot of that will depend on the results, but, but we'll see. Thank you so much, Daniel. Dr. Freer, I'm going to jump in and ask a question because um, I think you've seen there's the the, 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 can, the women candidates that are running are a bit different compared to uh, the previous elections. We now have women from tribal backgrounds. And I think this to us is a first. Um, I don't know if you've seen like what happened with Mudid Tayari, like when she first, you know, announced that she's running for, 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 for elections, a lot of women were, you know, jumped in to support her because now we have a Twitter uh, for women, uh, Bedouin women who are outspoken, who are, you know, calling for their rights. And she was kind of like a queen. And then, then someone did a hoax account and then, you know, that she signed that document. And then there was a backlash and everyone wanted to like, you know, rescind what they said. Um, but she's still, is still pushing through. So this is kind of different to have someone who is not only veiled, but also wearing a niqab. So she's representing a different um, uh, audience of, of and a class of women as well. Um, do you see this as a positive thing? Even if though she doesn't make it, like what are your opinions of this based on um, your book and what you've mapped out? Um, thanks for bringing that up. I think it's a great point. I do think this in this election, we are seeing more diversity in terms of female candidates. And I think that's important because it's, it's I mean, it's strategic. It's a way to reach female voters and dip not in, in outlying districts. I'm, I'm, it's also, I think, encouraging that there can be change in terms of Tri tribal candidacies. I think the, the traditional wisdom has been, well, women don't have access to uh, to tribal primaries, to Diwaniyat in the same way that men do. And this is, you know, much worse in tribal areas. But the fact that now, you know, even, even in these areas, women are demanding a voice, I think is a, a step in the right direction in terms of 
in terms of seeing a different type of candidate and also seeing that that in some senses female candidates can represent Kuwaitis of different constituencies as well. Um, so yeah, I think I think there is a change. And and as I mentioned, this is the first time that, I, at least for me, I'm seeing a lot more from Islamist accounts um, about engaging women voters and the need for women to be in in parliament, which I have not seen so much of in, in the past. And I mean, I don't know how that would like square with the you know the the call for very extreme segregation if there were a woman in in parliament with this values document. I'm not sure how that would even. Um, if that would come up. Um, but yeah, but I think it's it's encouraging to see more uh, different types of, of female candidates. So um, we will see kind of what happens. Great, thank you so much. So we're gonna, we're, you know, gonna wrap up um, with closing remarks and maybe we can use um, one of the questions from our audience, Fahad Dasmet, who is asking, to what extent do you expect the government's new overtures will help overcome some of the deeply seated apathy with the political system among many voters. So we can use his question um, as you know your closing remarks. Uh, two minutes uh, per speaker, Dr. Ghanem. Uh, well, you see, the main thing in this whole uh, election, as you said, we, have, we had 19 uh, elections before. Results of elections will not necessarily decide what comes after. I guess the initiative came from the government and promises are promises. They don't necessarily keep them. This time it is put to the test time. You know, I always, I always describe election as football match. Football match has a definite time, time to start, time to end. Election has a definite time. It starts on eight o'clock in the morning and it finishes at eight, eight in, in, in the evening. And then they made more promises, all time tested. They said that we will not vote for the uh, uh, speaker and we will not vote for parliamentary election. And also they did some extra things like, you know, the, uh, the issue of the voting for. Uh, this is the test for movement in, 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 in forward. If that is achieved, then you can build on it. Depending on who is coming, now we know almost certain who is coming as a uh, as a speaker, and we think that the speaker at maybe at his uh, late uh, uh, career is not beginning now, and he's not been absent from political uh, issues. All things is, is known, and he will not be able. To, he, there is there are some agreements on issues. These agreements on issues might move things forward. Elections, we have had problems with the parliament and uh, things which I worked on, uh, specifically the DNA law and the, uh, the, the death penalty for violators that, I've, I've, you know, I have a lot of information, that's, that's a different matter. As for women, I could sense, I don't see that necessarily they are winning, but I could, since there is an acceptance more than before, and there is a room for competition, serious competition for women, that might make it uh, a, a winning winning block. So my uh, assessment is that there are three women who are on the table. They might win, uh, but if they don't, they will be at least within within the competition uh, uh, major. Thank you so much, Dr. Daniel. I, I'll try and, and, and be, uh, be quick here. I, I know we're running out of time. Um, unfortunately, as I, I think that the government's, some of these new overtures, they may do things like help level the playing, fee, playing field amongst candidates. They might attract um, new types of candidates or old candidates to return. But there's very little in these things that are either designed or going to overcome this apathy um, amongst voters. And that's really because in, in, at the end of the day, a system where individual candidates run, where you vote for one person in a district of 10, where each candidate only needs 2% of the voters in her district in order to win. Uh, at the end of the day, that's not a, you know that kind of system 
is not going to galvanize people around political issues. It's not going to encourage, as Dr. Rana mentioned earlier, candidates to work together, to campaign together. It's not going to allow them to work together in parliament. And to me, no amount of creativity, no amount of, you know, kind of small scale reform or adjustment in the electoral system, even if the most interesting, exciting candidate runs, at the end of the day, that interesting, exciting candidate is only going to attract interest amongst a small number of people. And so the system is designed really to encourage this kind of apathy. It's designed to uh, make individual candidates um, attract the support of individuals in their tribe or group or, or, or whatever. It's not designed to have this effect of, of attracting interest in programmatic policies or, or kind of, um, you know, bigger things. And that's the unfortunate reality, I think. I think you, you struck a nerve with the, with the design of the system. That's a very, very on spot point. Uh, Dr. Freer. Well, luckily, I agree with, with pretty much everything that's been said before me. Um, so I won't I won't add too much. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, I think it'll be interesting to see what turnout numbers look like, especially among kind of the the newly registered voters. I'm, I'm not entirely sure, especially, you know, kind of a post COVID election. It'd be interesting to see, like, to the extent to which people want to engage in the system more or less, given um, the change in government rhetoric. I also agree with um, Dr. Ghanem's point that a, a lot of the promises that the government made are very specific and have been made very publicly. So I think it would be quite difficult for the government to backtrack on those, on, for instance, getting involved in the election of the, the Speaker of Parliament. So I, I, I think that that may, it, you know, I think it's kind of a trust building exercise that over time, if the government follows through on what it says it will do, I mean, maybe there will be more trust in the system, but I think that takes time. Um, and and I also do do think the, the issue of apathy runs deep within this system. And, and another issue that we've discussed is there may be apathy due to the fact that there's not been much unity in terms of discussing the issues at hand. I mean, what about actual solutions for economic diversification, for the housing issue, for the Badoon crisis? I mean, for for all of these somewhat urgent, you know, like issues, I don't see a ton of cooperation and, and a ton of cooperative engagement on those issues. Um, and instead, we have more more focus on things like the the values document um, rather than than on how to move things forward politically, um, economically as well, socially within Kuwait. Thank you so much. Thank you to our audience for joining us and sharing their questions. Thank you to all our speakers. It's such an honor moderating this this panel, and um, we'll see how this election turns out to be. Thank you so much, and good night or good day to everyone. Thank you.